Good evening and welcome to our midweek moment. I'm going to be singing for this evening uh, you a song that a friend of mine wrote called Lord Here Am I. Father, we thank you that you do meet with us and, and that when we come and desire to draw near, that you welcome us. Father, I pray that you would allow us to be refreshed by your spirit tonight. Wherever we are, whatever we have going on, that you would allow us to be refreshed by you. To know that you desire to meet with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, church family. Thank you for joining us for this midweek moment. Uh, a few things that I want to remind you of. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to remind you that we are currently taking donations for our food pantry. Uh, our church uh, keeps a food pantry on site so that we're able to provide 
uh, some, uh, some small assistance to families in need in our church and then also in our neighborhood. And so uh, what we ask you to do from time to time is if you can bring uh, some cans of non-perishable food. And we have a list that uh, we've passed out here at the church and our, our office keeps a current list of what we're running low on. So if you have any questions about it or if you haven't seen the list, um, feel free to call the church office and uh, ask for Kelly and she'll tell you what we need. But uh, we appreciate your supporting us in that way because that allows us as a church family to be the hands and feet of Jesus when needs arise. And so thank you for your continued support of our food pantry here on site. I also want to remind you to um, continue to take your flat Jonah pictures. Even though we're, we're through with Jonah's story, uh, we're continuing to build to it or build for it as we live out our summer. And so we've had fun watching your experiences with Flat Joma, seeing what you've been up to uh, the last several weeks. And so you can continue to, uh, to take those and send those, and uh, we'll be able to share those together at the end of the summer, and I think it'll be a lot of fun for us. And then finally, I want to remind you that uh, we're drawing near to Summer Music Day Camp. And so if you have a child or grandchild or a kid in your family or neighborhood uh, who has completed kindergarten to the sixth grade, they are eligible to come and be a part of Summer Music Day Camp, and they're going to want to. Uh, summer Music Day Camp, every year uh, we've done this. They have a, a musical they learn, and uh, it's a great time of learning about the Bible, but also a time of worship and using their gifts. And uh, at the end of the week, they're able to share that with us. Also, in the afternoons, they have a lot of fun and just enjoy being kids. But it's a great time. The cost is $50. But as we've said before, if that's a hang-up in any way, let us know because we do have some scholarship funds available. So hope that you can uh, have your kids or grandkids here for that. And if you have any questions, feel free to holler at Lee. He'll be glad to talk with you about that. Well, we've been looking for the last few weeks at uh, what the Bible says about God's presence throughout the scripture. Uh, we've been following along kind of the outline of a book uh, by a professor of mine. Uh, the book is called The Temple and the Tabernacle by J. Daniel Hayes, and it just gives an overview of how we see God meet with his people from Genesis to Revelation. And so we've been walking through historically and chronologi chronologically how God met with his people because our God is a personal God. And so as we go through the scripture, we see that lived out over and over and over again. And one of the pledges that God makes and repeats uh, is that he desires to be a personal God. He tells uh, the family of Abraham, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will be with you. And that's something that later on in the New Testament, as uh, Jesus uh, calls his people, as Jesus completes the mission that uh, God set about, he completes the work that God began through Israel, uh, through Abraham's family to bless all the nations of the world. Again, Jesus is the presence of God, and he's living out that call and bringing to fruition that aim of God for God to be with us, for him to be our God, for us to be his people. And so we're continuing to walk through each week. Um, where we've been, we've, we've seen initially at creation, God was present with Adam and Eve there in the garden. And even the language, the description of the Garden of Eden has some temple language, temple references to it. And so that's kind of, if you will, the first temple we see the first place where God's presence is with people on earth. But of course, Adam and Eve disobey God. And so they're kicked out from God's presence. But God didn't abandon humanity. Instead, God appeared to Abram and his family and continued to work with him. And ultimately, when uh, Abram's family grew and went down to to Egypt and they were enslaved, God rescued them and brought them out from slavery. And then he said, I will be with you. I will be your God. You will be my people. And he demonstrated his presence with them, the pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. And he had them later build 
the tabernacle, that movable or mobile tent that would house his presence as they wandered through the wilderness toward the promised land. They saw the presence of God come down on the tabernacle, and they knew that God really was present with them. Later, as Israel had established a kingdom there in the promised land, Solomon built a temple, a permanent structure, and he prayed that God's presence would come and inhabit that temple, that God would be with them in the temple as he had when they'd wandered. And that's exactly what they saw. God's presence comes down in a visual way, in a very clear and unmistakable way. And so the people of Israel know that God is with them still. He is present. It's not just kind of flowery language. It's actually what God has done. But they disobey God. And so because of that, God's presence leaves the temple. God's presence actually lifts up and leaves the temple because they had disobeyed God over and over again. And God said, I, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to remove my presence from you. And as a result of that, the, the nation of Babylon was able to come in and to destroy the nation of Judah and burn the temple so that the structure was actually flat. Um, now, in that time, uh, the people were able to come back. After the time of exile, they were able to come back to build another temple. We looked at that last week. But we never see God's presence come down to that second temple. There's never a time where God's presence comes to the temple built you know, after the exile. In fact, the first time we see God's presence come to the temple is in Luke 2, we said last week, where Jesus is carried in the arms of his mother to be dedicated there at the temple. That's when God's presence returns to the temple. Now, when we get into the New Testament then, we see almost a, a divergence, of two different paths or two different ways of thinking about the temple. On the one hand, there's the building. And we said it was rebuilt when the, the exiles come back. Uh, then in uh, about the end of the first century B.C. and the start of the first century A.D., um, King Herod the Great decides to renovate that temple. Remember we said it wasn't as nice as the first one. So King Herod wants it to be really nice. He takes it all the way down to the foundation stones, rebuilds it again. This time it's really nice, but we never see God's presence there with them. And then ultimately Jesus comes and he tells the people in Mark 13, you know, one day this temple too is going to fall. Not one stone will be left on another. And that happens in 70 AD. Rome comes in and destroys that temple. But in the New Testament, you see the word temple used in a different way. And it's almost like there's a separation between this building, the temple, and the presence of God. In John 2, Jesus refers to his body as the temple. Because Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, he is the presence of God there with him. And so as Jesus is walking and carrying out his ministry, there's, uh, from a theological perspective, wherever Jesus is is the temple, because that's where the presence of God is. That's where the presence of God is meeting with people. Remember Jesus said, you know, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will rebuild it. He wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his body. He would be crucified, but three days later he would rise from the dead. But then after Jesus ascends to the Father, there's more talk about the temple. And we understand what that means as we go through into the New Testament a little further. We know that after Jesus ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit to come and to dwell in his followers. So that all of us who follow Christ have God's presence, his Holy Spirit dwelling within us to guide us and to shape us to be more like Jesus. And so there's a sense in which each of us as individuals are a temple 
of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul tells the believers there, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? And God is, God's presence is in you. So there's this idea where God's presence is with all of us. And so that's part of why Paul says, be careful how you live. Be careful the way that you conduct yourself because as followers of Christ, God's presence is within you and you really do express the presence of God. So you want to be careful how you live and how you treat your body and how you, you, know, how you conduct yourself. You want to understand that you are holy as his people because your body is the presence of God. But that's mentioned, that's not actually the emphasis. In the New Testament, it's emphasized even more, not that we as individuals are the temple of the Holy Spirit or the temple of God, but actually that as followers of Christ together, that we are the new temple. That all followers of Christ embody the place where God's presence is. Uh, we see this in a couple of different places. I'm just going to read two. Um, but in Ephesians 2, he talks about uh, how uh, followers of Christ, God was saving people from all different backgrounds. There was Jews and Gentiles that were now together the church. They were you know, followers of Jesus from all these different walks of life and different backgrounds and different histories. And Paul's writing about the beauty of that. And he says that, listen, now, and this is uh, Ephesians 2, 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself, as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So here, Paul is using the, the image of a temple, the image of the building, to describe how followers of Jesus are the temple of God now. Saying, you know, when, when people have the building, the building was kind of like a picture of, we know this is where God's presence is, and they had that, that symbol. Paul's saying, now look, as followers of Jesus, when you're out in the world, you are the presence of God. God is at work through you. You are an ambassador of God. That In the way you live, in the way you talk, in the way you treat others, people are actually encountering God's work, God's activity, they're encountering God's love through you, through your life. And when people see his church gather, whether it's for a worship service on Sunday or just gathering out, doing life together, you know, serving and, you know, just being a light out in the world, when people see that, that is the presence of God on display. And so Paul uses the image of the temple to describe how the church, how all of us as members of the church are now the presence of God. We are the temple as we live our lives day in and day out. And so that's part of why we want to be mindful of how we live and how we speak and how we conduct ourselves because we know when people see our lives, that's a reflection on God. We also know that when we are around people or when we, we gather uh, with people in times of need. People experience the presence of God through us as we represent Him. Another passage that talks about what it means for us as followers of Christ, as a body, as all of us as followers of Christ, are God's presence now, the temple. Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians 6. He, he's writing about uh, how, as followers of Jesus, they should, uh, they should live distinct lives. They should you know, be different than their idol-worshiping neighbors. 
And he says in verse 16, he says, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Again, that aim that God established and shared early, way back in the beginning of dealing with Abraham's family, we see how now he's continued that to fruition. Where now we as followers of Christ, we know that God is with us. His presence is with us. So we don't have to go to one particular building in one particular place. Instead, as his people, when we gather together, we know that he's always with us, but we know that when we gather as a people, there's something special there. We represent and experience the presence of God in a unique way. And so that's part of why it matters even we that we as a church continue to gather and continue to be with one another because we know that as we do, we experience God's presence in a unique way. And our world sees God's presence in a unique way. And so as we wrap up tonight, I, I just want to encourage us, let's continue to pray that our world would see God's presence in the way that we live, in the way that we conduct ourselves, and that God would show us how to be faithful in living in a way that's honoring to Him, honoring to His name, that's, that's consistent with what it means for us to be God's temple in our world. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You that You have been at work so faithfully and so consistently down through the years that you've drawn us to yourself and that you have drawn us together. God, when we put our trust in Christ and you pour out your spirit on us, we know that you do come to dwell in us. Our body becomes your temple. But in an even bigger way as your followers together we're called to be your temple you dwell with us as your people and we're called to live in a way that's reflective of that and so father shape us mold us mold us as a church family mold us as individuals so that when people encounter us when we're with others father that they would experience your love and your grace that they would experience you at work in us and through us Father, may we be a faithful reflection of your presence in our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.